Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. Yes, I And we're continuing in the series of the history of the Ottoman Empire. This episode is between 1500 and 1600 and it's called the peak of the Ottoman Empire. Peak, y'all. So we gonna check this vibe out here, you know what I mean? Keep them comments coming. You understand what I'm gonna say? Like the video if you like it. Drop a like on it for me and thing, you know what I mean? But let's go ahead and YouTube with Sib Sibba and learn some stuff about this Ottoman Empire. Set of the 16th century in the Ottoman realm, Bayezid II was already locked in an intense naval war with the Venetians that would last until 1503. Tackling the new century with a desire for further consolidation, the Ottomans, under the command of Admiral Kemal Rice, found triumph by the end of this Turkish Venetian war ultimately forcing the Venetians to once again come to a peace agreement with the Turks. While this victory served well for the continued fortifying of Ottoman power in Europe, over in Anatolia, the environment was becoming increasingly unstable. By the year of 1511, supporters of the Safavid dynasty began to rebel against the growing dominance of the Ottoman Empire. That was kind of inevitable. Though they were forced to back down after the defeat of their leader, Shakulu. Meanwhile, bitter dissension over the succession of the throne developed between Bayezid's sons, Selim and Ahmed. Here we go again. As both candidates attempted to rally support from different territories. Family leaders, fighting. The Sultan's advisors and Janissary Corps began to show a preference towards Selim concurrent with Bayezid's increasing concern about the possibility of Ahmed seeking aid from Shah Ismail in Persia. Finally, in 1512, Sultan Bayezid II made his decision by abdicating to Selim, who would later have his brother put to death to avoid any further conflict. Bayezid passed away only a month after his retirement. Swiftly upon ascension to the throne, Sultan Selim I eradicated any potential threats to his position by having his brothers and nephews executed, allowing himself to focus solely on any external dangers. One of these hazards came in the form of the Shah Ismail and his Kizilbash Turkmen adherents over in Anatolia, briskly putting an end to a revolt brought by the Kizilbash Selim then turned to Ismail himself, subsequently overpowering the Shah's forces at the Battle of Chaldaran in 1514. While the Safavid troops consisted of simple cavalrymen, Selim's army, which was upwards of 100,000 men. See, that's the thing about uh, having vast power like that. You're going to have to keep quelling uprisings constantly. You just, there's going to be peace to a certain degree, but there's going to be dissension too. You know what I'm saying? That, that when you conquer all these lands, a lot of people are going to be disgruntled. You know what I mean? Most wouldn't act on it, but there's some that's going to go, you know what? No, I ain't having it. And, and that's a history that keeps repeating itself over and over again was able to rely on muskets and cannons. By the end of the clash, the Ottomans moved on to seize Tabriz. Still season places. Capital. Then continued toward the Mamluk dynasty of Egypt. Emerging victorious from both the Battle of Marj de Rik, in 1516 and the Battle of Radania in 1517 against the Mamluk forces, the Ottomans, in doing so, were able to bring Egypt, Hejaz, and all of the Levant into their empire. Wow. They are just taking everything. 
Thus, by Selim the First's death in 1520, not only had the cultural and geographical nucleus of the empire shifted, but it is believed that his reign brought forth an expansion of roughly 70%. Following the passing of his father, Selim's only son, Suleiman I, became the next and later widely revered Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, known in the West as the Magnificent, and by the Ottoman Magnificent. as the Lawgiver. Suleiman birthed a time of immense military, legal, and cultural change within the Empire. While the chief Sharia law, or sacred law, was not something that could be changed by the Sultan, Suleiman was able to do some notable restructuring of the Kanun, or system of criminal land, tenure, and taxation legislation. This new, final revision became known as the Ottoman Laws, and would remain intact for the next three centuries to come. Suleiman also made adjustments to laws that affected varying religions within the empire, taking a similar approach of tolerance to the one of the late Bayezid II, including, but not limited to, the formal condemning of blood libels issued against the Jewish population. Cool. Well, yeah. Simultaneously, as these legislative and cultural shifts transpired within the empire, outside of the sovereign borders, build-out continued, almost immediately taking aim at the Christian powers in both Europe and the Mediterranean, Suleiman I led his forces to a victory at Belgrade in 1521, followed by the long-awaited seizure of Rhodes in 1522. Yeah, taking everything. Four years later, engaged with the Hungarian troops, the Ottomans not only vanquished their opponent, but also executed King Louis II of Hungary himself. When Suleiman came across the slain body of the Hungarian monarch, he remarked, May Allah be merciful to him and punish those who misled his inexperience. I came indeed in arms against him, but it was not my wish that he should be thus cut off before he scarcely tasted the sweets of life and royalty. This unexpected void in Hungary's authority sparked a new conflict for the throne between the Habsburg Archduke of Austria and the Transylvania Voivode. Amidst prevalent opposition to the prospect of Habsburg control, the Ottoman Sultan chose to accept Enosh as the new vassal king of Hungary. As an added venture to undermine any subsequent Habsburg meddling, Suleiman led another campaign in 1529, this time aimed at Vienna. Unfortunately for the Turks, an outbreak of troubles plagued their offensive and forced the Sultan to call off the feudile advances. Largely undeterred, by 1532, the Ottomans tried yet again to assail Vienna, but made very minimal progress after being stopped by the defending forces at the Siege of Guns, thus giving Suleiman's belief that Vienna was not a prize to be won so easily. A peace agreement was finally reached in Constantinople between Archduke Ferdinand I of Austria and the Ottoman Sultan the following year. The terms of the truce were decided upon by both sides. However, it did not take long for the integrity of the agreement to deteriorate. <laughs> when Enosh passed away in 1540, any remaining peace between the Ottomans and Austrians seemed to shatter altogether. Throughout a series of campaigns and annexations in 1541 through 1543, Hungary was eventually split into three individual Hungaries. On one side sat the Habsburg Hungary, which was adjacent to the Ottoman vassal state of Transylvania and neighboring the Transylvania. Ottoman Hungary. The succeeding 19 years marked a vigorous on and off war within the region forcing a long bout of peace negotiations in 1562. All the while, as the discord between the Christian and Muslim sides played out in one conflict, uh, here we go, a religious were conflict. also facing hostility over in the Middle East. Back in 1534, 
Suleiman launched the first of the three repetitive campaigns against the Persian opposition. The Ottomans would continue to push back against the Shah and his forces, participating in a prolonged chess game of territory exchange, until the final incursion ended with a peace treaty in 1544, securing various important gains for the Ottoman side. During this time, the Ottoman naval might began to flourish under Admiral Kerr Althin, taking on European allied forces near the coasts of Greece with great success. The range of the Turks' naval influence could be felt as far as the Indian Ocean. Wow. Where they came in direct competition with the Portuguese ascendancy. In addition, Suleiman's reign also expanded the scope of the Ottoman impact to North Africa and the Mughal Empire rounding out a long and prosperous period of development and consolidation, though not without the occasional shortcoming. Suleiman spent his final months at the siege of Sigetbar, which resulted in a taxing victory for the Ottomans, losing tens of thousands of men in the process, as well as their sultan. Oh, wow. Now, now the fight begins. With his brothers having died or been executed previously, Salim II became the new leader of the Ottoman Empire in 1566. The first of many who would fall into the same pattern. Salim's dominance and true authority was often undercut by the sway of Mehmed Sokolu, his grand vizier and the women of his harem, most notably his wife. Thoroughly uninterested in a life saturated in politics, the new sultan chose to leave much of the governing duties in the hands of the Grand Vizier. Nonetheless, Salim's reign was marked by the exchange of war for peace in regions previously contested by his father. The first treaty was signed in 1568, creating a new wave of non-aggression with Austria, mirroring the last ceasefire between the Ottomans and Safavids. While a rebellion in Yemen crept up shortly after, it was quickly subdued. The only main conflicts faced during the period of Salim's rule played out after the capture of Venetian territory of Cyprus in 1570, the same year that a peace treaty with Russia under the rule of Ivan the Terrible was reached in Constantinople. Subsequently, due to the aforementioned antagonism in Europe, the Battle of Lepanto ensued in 1571, which gifted only temporary victory to Venice until the following year. By 1574, the Ottomans had secured both Cyprus and Tunisia before the passing of Sultan Selim II. You see all the conflicts going on there? There's going to be people going back and forth, and, you know, and of course it comes through trade too, but you know. It's going to be mixing and stuff going on, you know. I don't understand why people think every, anything is pure, pure. It just can't be. That's just too much. Even war brings the mixing up of people. You know what I mean? Leaving the empire in the hands of Murad III. In drastic contrast with his father, Murad ruled over a period of both conflict and decline of parents within the empire seizing Fez from the Portuguese in 1578, and then broadening his authority in the Persian region, the Sultan eventually launched a new surge of combat with Austria that would last into the following century. Wow. During this time, a notable alliance was formed between the Ottoman vassal with the Austrians, despite the clear breach of terms with the Turkish suzerainty. The period of 1570 until 1590 also marked a relaunch of hostilities with the Safafid dynasty. Meanwhile, the state of affairs within the Ottoman borders fared no better. The constant conflicts demanded higher taxes, prompting inflation and a rapid dwindling of the overall permanence inside the empire, even causing a slump in the reliability of the Janissary troops. As only the second sultan, following Selim II, to never lead his troops into battle and to have his power undermined by the women of his harem? Murad's most impressive accomplishment may have been securing a diplomatic relationship with Queen Elizabeth I of England. 
arguing that the Islamic and Protestant worlds had more in common than either did to Roman Catholicism. The Sultan was able to form a trade agreement with the English monarch in 1581. Granting priority to England's merchants within Ottoman territory. These foreign relations outlived the Sultan himself, being passed from the hands of Murad III to Mehmed III. As the final Sultan of the 16th century, Mehmed III took on the growing alliance between his European vassals and Austrian enemy, initially facing a loss, though quickly bouncing back to defeat the Habsburg and Transylvanian forces at the Battle of Koresh Tesh in 1596. The end of the 1500s brought only slightly improved luck, as a peace agreement was reached between the Ottoman Empire and one of the vassal leaders. Mihai the Brave, who had found prior success in fighting off the Turkish troops. Sultan Mehmed III continued to hold the Ottoman throne into the 17th century and would reign for another three years to come. I'll be honest, man. I'm totally enjoying this Ottoman Empire thing. I hope you guys are enjoying it too, man. But uh, it's crazy how the brothers are executing the brothers. I mean, who is going to rule if something happens to you? That's going to be total chaos because they wouldn't know who to rule, especially if your kids are too young. Didn't stop a lot of them from putting them kids in uh, into positions of power and making a three-year-old emperor and stuff like that. Well, anyway, man, thank you guys for watching this with me. Hope you guys are had a, ha, have a, had a good week. We're going into a new week. Y'all take care of each other. Cool runnings, all right?